what it was like. You know? Okay, let's crack on. So, welcome to the Internal Education's online program of webinars. Okay, this is, we are right in the middle, in the heart of our series of new approaches to language teaching, aimed primarily at university teachers. Um, but also at the, anyone really, but especially those who teach adults, so private language schools, for example, colleges as well. Okay, let's not forget about them, yeah? Okay. Uh, we come to you from internal education, of course, but also from Pearson. We are the number one provider of Pearson books in uh, Ukraine and also London School of English, where I, Graham Jones, have been the director for the last 11 years in LSE Odessa. We've got schools in Odessa, Kiev, and Lviv, okay? Um, this is just a little bit about our program. We've got 24 days, so as I say, we're right in the middle. 45 sessions, wow, seven teacher trainers from different parts of the world, and we've got 195 books to give away, okay? I hope you've been the lucky winner of some of these books. Okay, this is the team. For this uh, webinar program, we have our international superstar, Hugh Della, uh, who wrote, amongst other things, a roadmap uh, outcomes as well, I believe. Yeah, I hope you managed to catch his webinars uh, a couple of weeks ago. Got Sam, we got Chris, we got myself, we've got uh, Lenaina Gennady and Yuvia. Okay, uh, what have we got coming up the rest of? Well, as you can see, the the, the webinars uh, fit into three categories. We've got latest trends, which is basically today's webinar fits into this category. We've got modern resources, talking about books and stuff, and digital learning, okay, very fashionable at the moment, yeah. So if you're interested in just um, one uh, area or just one speaker, you might be a massive fan of Chris Kirby, for example, you can search on the website and find all of his webinars that are coming up, okay. Uh, the rest of this week, today we've got Yulia, uh, doing a lot of digital stuff today at four and tomorrow at four, if you're interested in that, blended learning, technology, et cetera, et cetera, please register. And we got Sam tomorrow morning doing uh, stuff about teaching C1 level um, learners. You know, always tricky to teach such a high level. Some of you might have at your university such groups, you know, so Sam will be giving you some uh, advice there, okay? If you want to know about the whole timetable, please scan this QR code or go to our website yeah, and find out more about the rest of the timetable, okay? And of course, you will be getting a certificate sent to your email address that you gave when you registered. Um, certificate should come within a week, usually a much quicker. Um, yeah, so I know in Ukraine, certificates are very important, okay? So it'll come soon. So let's start with today. So. Uh, we're going to start at the beginning. Well, not at the beginning, actually. We're going to start what we have now. So what is today's teaching recipe? What should we put? Recipe is a good word. What should, what should we have? When you teach your class, it's a lot element of a lot of things that we mix to cause a great lesson. Okay. So let's see what's there. What's the, well, we should have a communicative, communicative, difficult to say, communicative classroom. What makes up this communicative classroom? Well, as it's uh, almost like a recipe, we have 500 grams of real world practice opportunities, you know, so realistic, yeah. Uh, oral production, very important. Students want to talk by and large. Uh, useful, relevant language should be relevant, of course. Receptive skills, so listening and uh, reading, you know, we have a bit of that in there. Okay, a pinch of correction as it's the community classroom. Maybe not too much correction, don't overcorrect, but just a pinch. Personalization, very important for the community of classroom. Yes, yeah, students want to talk about themselves or about their country or about their city. Eliciting, of course, very important. Not just telling, but trying to elicit the answers. Okay, pair work, oh, I'd say a heaped tablespoon. Definitely should, should be a lot of pair work in the community of classroom. And a large spoonful of appropriate topics and context. Always people talk about context when they talk about community of classroom. Okay, so. Uh -huh. What have we got now? Well, we've got what Scott Thornbury, my favorite um, sort of uh, ELT guru, most very famous ELT guru, says we live in a post-method era, okay? So it's difficult to say what we are using now in the classroom, but in order to work out how we got there, 
we are going to look at what has come in the past. Okay, so we're going to look at the history of grammar teaching. Okay, I'm going to take you through it from the beginning. So in the beginning, well, we're going to go back to the 19th century. I think this picture is not quite the 19th century, but it's pretty near. Uh, as you can see, it's sort of like a mashutka, isn't it? Uh, but without um, without the roof on it, you know, uh, more ventilation than a normal mashutka. So in the beginning, what did we have? Well, uh, we had this guy quite often, yeah. Uh, my parents probably might, you know, recognize such a guy. Certainly my grandparents would have taught with such a scary man in the classroom with his cane, okay, uh, delivering uh, corporal punishments, you know. So, you know, if you don't know the answer or if you're a bad person, he would hit you with his cane. And we had classrooms like this. Uh, some of these students look quite old, you know. Um, but yeah, classrooms like this, so individual desks, wooden desks. I remember when I went to school, I had the wooden desk with the flip open thing where I could keep all my books. And I even had the ink well, you know. I didn't use it. By by the time I went to school, we didn't have the um, the pens that you had to dip in order to write, but we still had the desks with this uh, ink well, which was very, very interesting, you know. Um, so yeah, the first method, really the first recognizable method was called the grammar translation method. Now. As it says on the tin, there was quite a lot of grammar and quite a lot of translation. For example, if you were learning um, English from German or German from English, you would have such a sentence. Now, excuse me and my German presentation, but I'm going to try and say this. The Rahmen des Mischweinchens gleitet weg die Tabel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, does anyone know, is anyone good at German? Does anyone know what that might mean or parts of it, what, what it might mean? Uh -huh. Well, a few people writing, maybe you're better than, at German than I am. Something on the table. Yeah, you're right. Actually, it is something on the table. <laughs> but what? Anybody got any ideas? Yes. Uh -huh. I studied German for three years, I think, at school. So... Uh, total gibberish, <laughs> more or less. Hamsters, whoa, uh-huh. I'm not sure it's hamsters, but it's something similar, yeah? Well, according to uh, my research, it, oh, guinea pig, good. The guinea pig's cage is slipping off the table, okay? So as we can see, this was the type of sentence that the students might have to translate, okay? Um, and translation started at sentence level and then they moved on to translating whole texts. Uh -huh. Now, the problem was that a lot, as somebody uh, accurately wrote there, there was a lot of gibberish. A lot of the sentences were just bizarre, you know, just used to um, demonstrate some grammar point perhaps, but not anything that you would say in everyday conversation like we have in a lot of the books these days, you know. So, yeah, in fact, a lot of the sentences maybe came from uh, literature, from classic, classical literature, because that's uh, originally what this method was designed for, uh, for to appreciate foreign literature. And it was actually called the Prussian method at the beginning because it started off in what was then Prussia, what is now Germany, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was some bizarre sense. To be honest, I studied French. French is my um, major, uh, as we say, at the university. And um, we also were doing a lot of translation, you know, translating this text to that text, you know, translating from French to English, English to French. So, you know, it's not gone away completely, as we'll look at later. You know. um, we also had something like this. So the teacher would say, or the teacher would write, write a sentence that consists of two concessive clauses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Join the clauses with an appropriate conjunct. Are you following me? Then start the first clause with clefting, one of my favorite words, clefting, and use an ergative verb. Are you still with me? It's not finished. In the second clause, use a reciprocal verb in the progressive aspect. Now, I hope you've come up with a sentence a little bit like this. Uh -huh. It was John who moved first, but the other two were still fighting. Uh, so you can see the progressive aspect at the end. You can see the clefting at the beginning. Uh -huh. um, I think move is a is a ergative verb. I think you know, <laughs> but it's not a word I've ever used in any of my classes in 22 years. You know, so that's a uh, yeah. So in in the grammar translation method, we had a lot of what type of language? What do we call this language? 
in the ELT classroom. Concessive clauses, reciprocal verb, progressive aspect. Anybody know what we call this type of language beginning with an M? Any ideas? Anybody know what this language might be called? A few people writing. Mundane. Ha! <laughs> uh, that is very true. It is quite mundane. Oh, uh-huh. Not bad, not bad. Monster. Ha! <laughs> or monstrosity. Monster, yeah, there's something like that, definitely. Uh, mad, yeah, that's a good idea. Mad language, yeah. Uh, but it is all, it's, it's, it, all these words actually exist, you know? Um, so it's what we call meta language. Well done, Elena. Yeah, so there was a lot of meta language in grammar translation because the teacher had to have a way of describing the language. Okay. Meta language is still used. I mean, if you say a verb, that's an example of meta language. Okay. Um, I sometimes, when I'm doing uh, CELTA courses, some of my uh, candidates will overuse meta language. I always say, well, are you sure they know what a plural noun is at elementary level. They might know what it is in Russian or Ukrainian, but they don't know what it is in English. So be careful there. So yeah, but grammar translation, a lot of meta language. So to, to sum up the grammar translation method, of course, the focus was only on writing. There was no speaking, nothing. Yeah. Accuracy was very important because it's writing. Yeah. And you had to be accurate. Yeah. A lot of memorization of rules. The rules were actually given at the beginning of the lesson. And then they had to apply the rules to the translation. Yeah? And there was some language analysis. Let's analyze why this is used here, why this isn't used there. So, yeah. And the interesting thing about the grammar translation method, it was a method, method, methodology without a method. The teachers weren't actually, there was no idea how the teachers were supposed to actually apply this method. So what usually happened, of course, is you went, or the teacher went around the room saying, uh, Dasha, read this sentence. Okay, now translate it. And that would go, uh, uh, the guinea pig is falling, no, slipping, slipping off the, ah, the chair table, okay? So, yeah, there, there was, no, nobody ever said how they were supposed to do it, you know? But, but anyway, that was the grammar translation method, yeah? Interesting, and we'll come back to that later. Now, moving on, ah, before we move on, at the end of every method, we're going to say grammar. Was there any grammar? Of course there was. Lots and lots and lots of grammar, yeah? Hence the name grammar translation method. It was basically only about grammar, you know? Okay, moving on to the 1940s. Now, the 1940s um, was, of course, a time of great change because it was a time of war, you know, uh, the early part of the decade. And later on, it was a time of, well, we need to change this. What's going to go on? And we had, of course... Um, we had war, so war means we need military intelligence, means we need language. People needed to learn, well, German, Russian, etc. you know, uh, French or whatever language, Japanese. So language became important. And of course, after the war, the Cold War, um, language became very important for, for the Soviet Union and for Britain, for America. You know, they had to learn the, the language of the enemy. You know, so of course the grammar translation method would give nothing to their speaking skills. So they had to think, we had to look at different methods, you know, how were they going to uh, become good? Well, they had to become very, very good in the target language. So um, we also had uh, the advent of behaviorism, you know, behaviorism and um, this the behaviorism greatly influenced two methods that we're going to look at, the direct method which we'll look at in a second, and audiolingualism, which we'll look at first, you know. So behaviorism, remember behaviorism was all about saying that learning was an effect of behavior change, and it had to be reinforced with positive or negative feedback. And uh, B.F. Skinner, you might have heard of him, uh, his first name was difficult to pronounce, so let's just say B.F. Skinner, um, he was the one who was a very big advocate of how behaviorism will uh, influence language learning because he thought that that's, he believed that that's how people learn their first language, you know? So what it is, we've got stimulus, which the stimulus is like the action, the response is the result, and the conditioning would be the positive or negative feedback. It was based also to some degree on an experiment that was done with rats and how they accidentally pushed the lever in their cage and the, the food came out and the rats went, oh, this is good. 
Uh, and so let's keep pressing the lever because we'll keep getting food, you know. So it was a little bit based on that, which was very, very interesting, you know. So behaviorism introduced first um, influence greatly, audio lingualism. Now, um, I remember things like this, you know, sitting in a, what we call a language laboratory and um, uh, listening to sentences, you know, and then repeating them. Um, yeah, so even at university, because as, as I've told you, um, I studied French, even at university, we had to go as part of our course um, to the language laboratory and do exercises. And of course, even then, even before my English lab, they could check if you'd done it or not, you know, which was a bit annoying. Um, so yeah, so we had it at school, we had it at uh, university, 80s and 90s. I don't think they still exist because we have my English lab and other such products, you know. Um, so, for example, we'd have uh, audio lingualism. The students would say, I'm studying grammar, what are you studying? He's studying grammar, what are you studying? They're studying grammar, what are you studying? You know? So, we had not so much grammar, but we had a focus on sentence what? Beginning with P. Any ideas? <laughs> Greetings from Kiev. Greetings to you. Uh -huh. So, what could the P mean here? Mm hmm interesting, yeah, patterns, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, sentence patterns were very important. So they didn't really call it grammar, because uh, it sort of wasn't really grammar. They called it sentence patterns, and it was all about habit formation, imitation, you know, listen and repeat, because again, Influenced by behaviorism, that's what they thought. That's the, that was the way that we learned our first language. So why can't we do it with the second language? You know? We also had a lot of drew. What could that stand for? If you've got sentence patterns, you need a lot of these. What could this stand for? Uh -huh. Good. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. We had a lot of drilling, yes. Uh -huh. So as you can see, these happy children bring drilled to death, I'm sure. <laughs> listen and repeat, listen and repeat, you know. So there was a lot of drilling, yeah, either by the teacher or by um, uh, autonomous learning, listen and repeat, you know. So, yeah, a lot of drilling. And also, in this approach, we had no true. What could that mean? No true. Any ideas? Uh-huh. Yeah, no translation, yeah? So again, trying to imitate the first language where, you know, a, a child will learn from their parents or the, the, the carer, they will pick up the language from them. You know, they don't translate, they don't explain even, you know, they just sort of, you know, listen and repeat. So there was no translation, completely the opposite of grammar translation, of course. You know. Okay. And we also had, though, one uh, development was uh, the first time we had some anal analysts of dialogues. Okay. So as you can see, quite interesting dialogues here. You know? So we've moved on to the written text to dialogues. What do you think of Mr. White's plan to go to India? I think it's reasonable that he should. I'm glad you approve of his plan. I can't see any reason I shouldn't. Now, did people really speak like this even in the 1940s? I'm not sure. Maybe certain people did, but the majority, I'm sure, didn't. So again, you can see dialogues, but they were based maybe on what upper class people in Cambridge spoke, not what you know people in a factory in Hull spoke. You know, so yes, <laughs> uh, interesting. You know, so um, yeah. Now, moving on to the direct method. Now, this guy here, very famous guy, most people in TEFL know this guy, Maximilian. De Berlitz. Now, as you can see, he actually died before the 1940s, but his ideas and, and his schools, because you might see they still exist, Berlitz schools, I'm not sure there's any in Ukraine, but they definitely exist in other places, um, they still, they're still going, yes, and you can learn from the Berlitz method, you know, or the Callan method, which is also greatly influenced by, by this guy. So, yeah, by the time he died, actually, um, it was a bit later on in the, in the sort of 50s, and the 60s where his uh, schools and his ideas became popular. It's often the case, isn't it? You know, like when artists die and then their, their um, art gets sold for millions of dollars. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he took uh, aspects of the audio lingual. So it was like a bit of a, a melange of ideas 
and he added to them. Yeah, logical. Yeah. So, for example, we have use of these things. You can call them pictures, or to give them the technical word, what do we call them? Uh -huh. Oh, visualization. That's one word. <laughs> it's actually two here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Uh -huh. Yeah, visual aid. So, of course, if no translation was allowed, because everything had to be in the target language, how can you actually uh, teach beginners, for example? Well, pictures, yeah, logical, I suppose, you know. We all still use pictures in the classroom, I'm sure, you know. So, um, yeah, so visual aids such as this could help to avoid translation. Uh -huh. We also had, I think I've already told you this, but what can we say? All instruction and learning was in the, uh -huh. what do you think the T and the L stand for here, guys? Yeah, target language. Uh -huh. Yeah, everything was in the target language. So if you can find on the YouTube uh, an example of the Callan method. It's crazy, you know. It's the 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 singer, the the teacher is is like it has a script, and they will basically keep saying stuff. The students repeat or answer questions, you know. And uh, the teacher is very hyper. <laughs> but it's interesting to watch. But everything is in the target language. No translation. There's pictures. A lot of repetition. Total immersion is what we call it. Just everything in that language. Um, and the idea was that um, it's, 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 again, like repeating the, the L1, learning an L1 experience, you know? Okay. So, yeah, more focus on speaking. Lots of focus on speaking, actually, yeah. Repetition, drilling, no translation, and the use of realia and pictures for the first time. But what do you think? Grammar? Guys, was there a lot of grammar in this? Is there a lot of grammar? Because, as I said, it's still being used, this approach. Is there a lot of grammar in this? What do you think? No. Huh? Not much. Well, yeah. Well, yes, but more based on patterns than rules. The teacher didn't really sit down and say, okay, we're gonna do the present perfect or future forms or second conditional. It was more looking at patterns, you know? Um, yeah, so not much grammar really there. A bit of a reaction, I suppose, to what came before, which is often what happens. Yeah. Okay, now moving on to the 60s, the swinging 60s, and a little bit the 70s, yeah, uh -huh, the disco years. What do we have here? Now, finally, some people, some bright sparks, realize that language, yeah, wait a minute, what's it for? What do we do with it? It's for communication, actually, you know? not just repeating and not just writing, but language should actually be for communication, you know? Uh, took a while. And we had this guy, very interesting guy, Stephen Krashen, yeah? Uh, he was a professor at a university in California. I think it was the 60s and 70s. He was a bit of a hippie. Um, he's still going, he's still alive. Um, still, You can still find, I think he's got a blog or a website. Um, not really a big influence these days, but um, he was very big in the 60s and 70s, you know. Uh, he, very fa you can find some famous uh, speeches that he made on, on YouTube, I'm sure, you know. Um, so Stephen Krashen was all about uh, the natural approach. Uh -huh. Natural, as you can, you can feel what's coming on here, yeah. So learning, he didn't think that actual conscious study was that useful. So Basically, throw away your textbooks. Don't do that, guys, whatever you do, yeah? But um, he would say, yeah, no, books, no, 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 okay? We shouldn't have books. We should just have unconscious absorption of the language. So what do you think? Not learning, but act. What do you reckon, guys? Now, behaviorism, uh -uh, that was gone. We were more into Chomsky here and his universal grammar theories and innate learning. So what do you think this could stand for, this ACK? So what's, it's not quite the opposite of learning, but it's sort of a bit different, not learning, because learning you consciously do something, but with this, accept, <laughs> could be, acceptance, yeah. Uh-huh, acquisition, 
It's a good word. Uh -huh. Now we're getting there. Yeah. So acquisition. Yeah. So basically, again, now the, the, how we learn our first language should change, as I've just said, from behaviorism to innate uh, learning and the universal grammar and Chomsky and all this. So they thought that everybody has the capacity to, to, to acquire a language. So why are we learning it? We should just sit around uh, under a tree and have some conversations with the teacher. Yeah, that's sort of what Krashen thought, you know? Uh, and the reason he thought about under a tree, for example, and not in a classroom, uh, we'll come to in a minute. But he also, how do you acquire the language? What is essential for, uh, for this? What do you think? In, what do you think? Well, how can you acquire the language? You need some in, mm -hmm. any ideas, guys, what this could mean? Uh -huh. Initial input. Yeah, input. Okay, so a lot of input inspiring. Yeah, uh, input. How do they get their input? Well, from the teacher, from listening to the teacher, having conversation with the teacher, from possibly uh, listening. Uh, watching TV, um, reading, you know, this type of thing. So he's, he always thought the input, what he came up with was this L plus one, uh, or sorry, I plus one, which was like input plus one. So the input should be slightly more difficult than the, the level the learner was currently at. So if the learner was intermediate, perhaps they should have input at an upper intermediate level, for example. You know, so I plus one became his great, I told you, Krashen has some great, theories i plus one you know and because you should sit under a tree not in a classroom for example or on the beach to learn you know we had to think about this this is all the way of saying we should lower the students what ah. anybody this is a very technical word anybody can come up with this ah. bill uh -huh. oh very good, yes, uh -huh. Elena, yeah. So you should lower the student's effective filter, which is basically a trendy way of saying that you should make students less stressed in the classroom, you know, or even not in the classroom as it was his idea, you know. So even comfortable chairs became fashionable, armchairs, you know, that type of thing. Uh, not, you know, wooden desks and all that, but nice, uh, soft, furnishing yeah where you could sit around maybe candles maybe some nice smelling scent who knows you know but anyway uh that was the thing yeah so i mean he's got a point you know we do learn better when we're not stressed yeah and most people do anyway you know um so was there any grammar in the natural approach what do you reckon Yeah, I think this one is a fairly easy question. Oh, oh no. Uh -huh. Well, yes, don't even mention it, yeah? There was no grammar explanations, no grammar presentations, no correction, yeah? Everything was just conversations, you know? So that was an extra point. Everything in the L1, that hadn't changed, you know? Total immersion in the language, yeah? All right, moving on. We also moved on to the 1980s, my decade when I was growing up. I definitely didn't wear a suit like that, you know, um, but I do remember the terrible fashions of the 80s. Um, and we had task-based learning, which of course is still around, cutting edge. Um, cutting edge is a great exponent of task-based learning. We have, there is a task in every unit. So task-based learning, um, well, what was the thing of tasks? Uh, it was a great uh, study that was called the Bangalore Project, a seminal project that was done in, in Bangalore, uh, in India, in the end of the 70s. And what they didn't, they didn't give the students exercises, they gave them grammar tasks, they gave them tasks based on real life, you know? But the tasks all should have uh, some sort of what? Out, mm -hmm. Anybody can guess what this must be? It's one word. Uh -huh. 
Yes, the tasks needed an outcome. What the theory was when we do grammar exercises, fill the gaps, well, they have an outcome, but it's only right or wrong, yeah? If you do a task and there is some, uh, there needs to be some result at the end of it, and then you've got an outcome, a communicative outcome, yeah? I'm, I'm a strong believer in this myself, that there should be, when you have a task, some sort of realistic, if possible, based on the real world, some sort of outcome, you know? So that was the task-based, yeah? And, there wasn't immediate cor uh, correction, but there was actually what type of feedback? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So we had delayed feedback. So the students would do the task and then there would be feedback on the board afterwards using the students um, to, to you know, to try to correct their own errors or examples of good sentences as well, of correct sentences, yeah. So TBL really, task-based learning, which is still very much with us, still very trendy actually, um, was really moving actually from fluency to accuracy rather than the other way of moving from accuracy to fluency, yeah. Um, more like learning by doing, the students did the task and by doing the task they learned and they tried to um, sort of um, negotiate and repair some communicative breakdowns during the tasks, you know. Um, was there grammar? Is there grammar in task-based learning? What do you reckon, guys? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of you are saying yes. Chunks, nice word, you know. Well, grammar is not explicitly taught. In, there's lots of ways of doing task-based learning and people often argue about what's the purest form of doing it, you know? Because of course you can do some input and then do the task, in which case, you know, the task is like the free of practice, yeah? But in pure task-based learning, there is not actually explicitly taught grammar, you know? Um, the grammar maybe comes afterwards, you know? There's lots of different ways of doing task-based learning, yeah? But we're not here to talk about that today, you know? So, uh, now we move into the 2000s, okay? Um, as you can see, the era where social media started to, to make an appearance and more and more media. Uh, and we had the lexical approach, actually written um, by Michael Lewis, a little bit of a controversial figure in the TEFL world, in the ELT world. Uh, he wrote it in 93. He did implementing the lexical approach in 97, which was sort of answering his critics in a slightly annoyed way. And uh, But of course, it was not until really the 2000s that it started to kick in to um, ELT training courses and ELT practice, you know. But it's a very interesting approach, okay. And this is probably his most famous quote. Uh, language consists of grammaticalized lexis, not lexicalized grammar. So basically, he was saying for the first time that lexis is more important than grammar, although he sort of denied this a little bit, but that's basically what he was saying, you know? Um, and for the first time, lexis was given predominance in, in the classroom, yeah, or in books, you know? So we had, for example, lots of these, make a decision, safe and sound, throw a party, highly likely. Michael Lewis and his lexical approach gave a lot of attention to these types of um, phrases, collocations, fixed phrases, etc. What do we call them? Yes, some of you are right. Oh, Elena's a big fan of this approach. Yes, chunks of language. That's why I've got a picture of some potato chunks in case you were wondering. Um, chunks of language, yeah, because it's true. We don't go around saying individual words to people, do we, when we speak? We actually give, you know, languages. He or his theory language is made up of chunks, which can even full sentences can be chunks so that's how we should learn the language as well makes sense when you think about it why teach individual words you should teach what goes around the words usually as well you know so yeah um he also we were back to this again from the 1940s so again not so much grammar but the car needs fixing my hair needs cutting the battery needs changing so not really grammar but we're back to language what did we call them can you remember Patterns, yes, okay. We had patterns rather than grammar, okay. So we're back to that again, interestingly. So yeah, the lexical approach 
also looked a lot at word frequency, how for the first time we looked at, should we be teaching this word? Because we don't actually use it very much, you know? We, we had the, the, the increase of computer-based studies of how frequent a word is or how frequent a collocation is. And this really helped with the writing of course books, you know? Um, so yeah, so we, we had uh, also authentic text, we have noticing, you know, that type of thing. So yeah, it introduced a lot of new things, yeah. Was there any grammar in the lexical approach? It sounds a little bit um, of an oxymoron, doesn't it? Uh, a little, yes. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, uh, well, not much. As we can say, we had sentence patterns, you know. Um, Mr. Lewis denied that his approach was uh, anti-grammar, you know, uh, he denied it in quite an annoyed way, which seemed to be his permanent setting, you know, so yeah, he denied that it was anti-grammar, he sort of thought it was in addition to grammar, but again, the problem, a bit like the grammar translation method all those years ago, it was an approach without a method, he never really said how we should teach this, of course, we could focus more on collocations, on chunks of language, but how are we supposed to teach this? Of course, there were some exercises that we can find more and more of in, in books these days, but how could you have a whole lesson or a whole course using the lexical approach? It was never really said. You know? Nobody's really said it. So, 2020, as we are now, uh -huh, not everybody's favorite year, but what have we got now? Uh -huh. So, if you look in, for example, Speak Out, when we got the approach to grammar teaching, We've got this. First of all, we've got examples in the course book, and then we've got rules, interestingly. Yeah? In a lot of course books, but especially Speak Out, we've got that. So what do we call this method of teaching grammar? So the students look at the examples, they think very hard, and then they try to work out the rules. What do we call this? Uh -huh. Yeah, well, self-discovery, true, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. very good, guys. Guided discovery. So guided discovery is very fashionable at the moment, and it's pretty good, yeah. Um, students think about it, you know. They're, they're not just given it on a plate by the teacher. Um, so, yeah, guided this guest discovery, <laughs> that's quite a good word. Uh, so in terms of... Guided discovery in terms of grammar teaching, I suppose we could write we work on the maxim of what you tell me, I hmm? what I work for myself, I hmm? yeah. So what you tell me, I forget. What I work out for myself, I remember. Which is generally true in life, isn't it? Yeah. What somebody tells you, you're more likely to forget. For what you do, work out yourself. You can remember. Yeah. So we have these two different approaches to teaching. So in terms of um, first examples and then rules, or first rules and then examples, what do we call these in terms of an a, approach to teaching? Huh? Yeah, you, two, you guys are good. So we've got inductive and deductive, yeah? Inductive is first the examples and then the rules, deductive first the rules and then the examples, yeah? And um, what have we got now? Well, actually, a lot of grammar teaching it's inductive. Of course, this is what we got at the moment in most of the course books. Yeah, students get the they get the examples in a text, then they uh, analyze the examples, and they have to try to work out the rules from the examples. So it's guided discovery or self discovery, as you said. You know. Okay. So going back to the communicative classroom, what we've got now. So let's have a look. Where do today's techniques come from? So what we're using in the classroom now, where do they come from? So drilling, can you remember? We do a job, lot of drilling. I'm a big fan of drilling in the classroom. Certainly works in face-to-face. -face. Uh, online learning can be a bit strange doing drilling, but where does it come from? Which of these methods and approaches do we get drilling from? Mm -hmm. Mm, audio lingualism, yeah. Uh -huh. What else? What else? Any other suggestions? Audio lingualism, good. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Ooh, natural approach. I'm not sure there's much drilling in the natural approach. Yeah. Not natural. <laughs> yeah. 
audio linguism, you remember? With the headphones, listen, repeat, or the teacher, listen, repeat, you know? Uh -huh. Dictation, well, we didn't talk about that, but uh, dictation made a bit of a comeback in the ELT classroom. I quite like dictogloss and other types of dictation. Where do you think this originated from? What do you think? Dictation is seen as a little bit old fashioned, but it's actually, uh, there's some very cool things you can do with dictation. Like school approach, a little bit earlier than that. Direct possible, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Victoria, yes. Uh -huh. So yeah, dictation actually started way, way back. Very traditional trick dictation, not dictogloss, but yeah, when they read and then write it down, you know? Uh -huh. Read and write and then check, yeah? So yeah, dictation, which we still use quite a lot now, came right from the beginning. Immediate correction. Where do you think that came from, guys? Which approach or method? I suppose when I'm talking about immediate correction here, I'm talking about uh, spoken rather than written. Natural approach, oh well, no, there was no correction in the natural approach, uh -huh, I'm afraid. Yeah, it actually came from these. In terms of speaking, audiolingual direct method, yeah, would be a correction, get it right before we can move on, yeah, so audiolingual and direct was where we had immediate correction, but what about delayed correction? Where might this have come from, yeah? Quite popular these days after freer practice or a speaking activity. Very good, yes, task-based learning, or maybe the natural approach, if there was any uh, feedback at all, yeah, task-based learning, definitely direct approach. Um, realistic practice opportunities, realistic, yeah, that's the key here. Where do you think it first came in that there was actually using realistic language rather than some strange uh, stuff about guinea pigs? You know, where do you reckon that might have come? Uh -huh. Natural approach, lexical approach. Well, yeah, natural approach and task-based learning. Remember I said that task-based should be, uh, if possible, as much, as much based on real life as possible. Yeah, natural approach, they were just chatting under a tree, so of course it was realistic. Yeah. Okay, ah, now is an easy one, I reckon. More work on collocations on fixed phrases. We can see it now. If you compare the books now with when I started teaching 22 years ago, there's definitely a lot more work on collocations and fixed phrases. Where would this have come from? Uh, yeah, this is not a difficult one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the lexical approach, of course, Mr. Lewis. Uh, language analysis. So we still analyze the language, even though we have an inductive approach, we still analyze it. Why do we use this? What's the use of it, you know? The, the, the meaning, form and prom, and sometimes the appropriacy. Where do you think this came from originally? Yeah, grammar translation, yeah. Uh -huh. It's interesting, isn't it? How we've still got, we still use a lot of ideas right from 200 years ago, you know. So, the community classroom, which we've got now, is there any grammar? Absolutely, you know, in almost every lesson, especially with certain levels, maybe not so much at uh, uh, advanced level, where you look, well, I tend to look a lot at uh, Lexis, but yeah. We tend to choose grammar almost every lesson, yeah. And so despite all the so-called sort of anti-grammar movements, we still end up with a lot of grammar in the classroom, which is very, very interesting, yeah. Uh, at least 500 grams. 
I would say in every lesson. Yeah? 